Good morning and welcome to another presentation at Warriors Corner. The topic, NATO Convergence and Interoperability in Modernization. Presenters, Major General Stephen Moranian and Brigadier General John Byram. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Steve Moranian. I am the Commanding General of the 56th Artillery Command, uh, stationed in Wiesbaden, Germany. With me today is the Army's newest Brigadier General, John Byram, got promoted yesterday. Let's give him a round of applause. John commands the second multi-domain task force, also stationed uh, in Wiesbaden, Germany. And uh, together, our organizations are going to uh, spend the next 30 minutes with you uh, introducing our commands, talking about uh, where we are in our modernization efforts and our growth to operational capability. Uh, we'll then talk a little bit about uh, our uh, interoperability efforts as we modernize uh, in conjunction with our uh, allies and partners in theater, which is a really exciting topic, and I'm thrilled to see so many of our allies uh, sitting in the audience here today. Uh, it's going to be a great conversation. Uh, so before we get into the meat of it, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes, if we could go to the second slide, please, introducing uh, our formation, and I'll let John do the same uh, for his. So the 56th Artillery Command takes its lineage from the 56th Field Artillery that goes all the way back to uh, World War II, actually. But most notably, it was the Army's only uh, general officer command for a field artillery organization uh, back in the 80s up until 1991 when it performed the mission of being the command and control for the Pershing II missile until the INF Treaty uh, made that obsolete and it went into an inactive status. Uh, the 56 was reborn last October, and uh, it became the Army's first theater fires command. And I will tell you, there is no uh, real difficult uh, uh, concept behind what we do. At the theater level, we do the same thing for my boss that a division artillery would do for a division commander. We basically serve as the force field artillery headquarters for the senior land component command in theater. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in a moment, but that is the gist of it. John's command is a little bit more complex. It's dealing with some more cutting edge um, uh, new domain uh, activity, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking about that. So let's go to the next one. Just two minutes on what our command has been asked to do. We're a headquarters that uh, comprises a headquarters battery, and the second multi-domain task force. So basically, John's organization um, provides us with the, the meat behind our ability to synchronize and coordinate fires uh, and effects in theater. He'll talk through what, uh, they, uh, what they have in their uh, formation on the next slide, but for what I've been asked to do by, uh, by my commander, uh, it deals with four major categories, and I know there are seven items there, but they've been into four very neat buckets. The first is uh, targeting. It's to grow the targeting enterprise, grow our ability to be effective in seeing things and communicating those back to those who would shoot them. The second deals with uh, doing our doctrinal role of being the senior field artillery headquarters in theater. Uh, all of the things that you would think of that a force field artillery headquarters would do from positioning theater level assets to ammunition resupply to uh, waiting the main effort by task organizing for uh, the artillery forces and theater. All of those doctrinal things that we grew up with as artillerists uh, back in the day are part of our portfolio. The third deals with integrating new capabilities, both formations and equipment into the, the theater and uh, being able to employ them as they come, uh, come to us as additional capabilities. And the final one, which is where I'm gonna bridge and pass it to my partner here, is talking about um, multinational interoperability. My biggest challenge that I have uh, as I look at uh, our assignment and as our organization grows is how do we grow our interoperability in a positive direction and take advantage of all of the initiative that nations of the NATO alliance and our future allies uh, in the high north are, uh, are growing. 
if we look at what our um, capabilities are now and where we will be five, ten years from now, we ought to have a path that goes forward. And I'm spending a lot of time on the road visiting our allies, visiting our future allies, and talking to, with them about what the state of their current uh, organization for fires formations is and where do they aspire to go because knowing that will be the key to being able to integrate and create a, a fires architecture as technology enables us to be able to communicate so that as um, as we fight as an alliance we have the ability to get the best shooter shooting to any target that's identified from any sensor so with that I'm gonna pass it to John and look forward to your questions here in a little bit Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is John Byram. I'm the multi-domain task force commander over in Europe. And uh, if I had a dollar for every time that somebody asks me what the heck is a multi-domain task force and what they do, I would be a very rich man. So that's what I'm going to take this initial time is to explain to you what is in the framework of a multi-domain task force, and then what do I think are the core functions that these multi-domain task forces can actually do with that task organization that we have. So number one, the multi-domain task force has an overall headquarters, and you can see that at the top there of the, in the uh, task organization graphic. Um, that headquarters is an, very similar to a brigade headquarters, but of note, it has a very robust fire section within that. So you're able to either have internal fires capabilities that you can plan and synchronize fires, and when I talk the fires for that, I'm talking the lethal fires, the kinetic fires. Um, and then you have the ability to synchronize that as well. Um, but what I would argue is the bread and butter of the multi-domain task force is the multi-domain effects battalion, that MDEB they're calling it. Um, what that has that is very unique is internal to it, it has an MI company, a military intelligence company, um, that I have it focused primarily on the targeting aspect of intelligence. And that, and I'll explain in a second what that feeds into. Um, you also have cyber capability within that in a cyber company um, that has defensive cyber capability and also uh, analysis and targeting experts within that formation as well. And then you have another intelligence company that allows you to uh, conduct intelligence in the space domain. Um, and then lastly, there's a signal company within that that has expeditionary signal um, capabilities, very agile, very small, that allow you to move forward and communicate both network, um, SATCOM, all the various aspects. So the question for this then becomes, what do you do with this? And, and before, let me take a step back. The other battalions in the full build for a multi-domain task force are the Long Range Precision Fires Battalion. Um, and then there is an Air Defense Battalion and a Support Battalion as well in that. Um, so what can this formation actually do? And this goes down to the means that you see there. Um, number one, I would argue that it allows you to do multi-domain reconnaissance. Within this formation, and especially, especially within that multi-domain effects battalion, you have the internal capability to be able to do the reconnaissance that you need to do for, and, and tie into that military intelligence company and do the intel fusion to be able to answer those reconnaissance objectives in these various domains. That is very powerful. Number two is the multi-domain targeting. And this is where the relationship with the 56 Fires Command is very complementary with these organizations where we can tie directly into the joint and combined targeting processes that are out there. And, and for those who don't know, it is, it's very complicated targeting in some of these domains, whether they're cyber, space, there's, there's, there's numerous authorities and various aspects to that that you have to maneuver through, and this organization is designed to be able to do that, and it's especially effective with the 56 Fires Command with me serving under them because they have that expertise um, at the senior levels in that organization. 
And then lastly, the third is the multi-domain synchronization. And in these multi-domain task forces, we're building what are called all-domain operations centers. So basically picture what you would think of with an operations center, but being at the right classification level to be able to synchronize across all of these domains, many of them which are very classified depending on whatever country that you're from. So that is what I would call the core functions of this. Uh, something that I've been very involved in is this interoperability with our partners and allies. And what I've been studying and meeting with numbers of folks in, those, in the various nations over in Europe is understanding um, what their capabilities are, what are they interested in doing in multi-domain operations, and then how can we interoperate. And I'll tell you, that, that is not an easy task. Um, but I think it's absolutely pivotal for the future as we look forward and try to understand how can we gain exponential results in this multi-domain fight that we're going into, whether we want to or not. Of note, what I have found is, you know, as a general rule, not everybody wants to create what we have, this multi-domain task force. Each nation is approaching this problem set as they see best based on you know, their interests that they're developing. But what is powerful is, you know, each of them are making investments in particular aspects of this. And if we all understand what we're doing, that is what I'm really working hard at, is trying to understand where those capabilities are and how we can gain the exponential results um, as we move into the, the multi-domain fight in the future. So with that being said, I'll uh, turn it back over to General Moranian. Okay, well, thank you, uh, and I, I hope that that gives you uh, a little bit of meat on the table to, uh, to, to stimulate your thoughts, and uh, we're looking forward to answering your questions about our formations and, uh, and what we're doing currently in uh, Europe and the trajectory of where we're headed. Yes, sir. Here you go, sir. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian Sprenger with Defense News. As you visit your, you know, the partners in Europe, what state do you find their fires uh, organizations to be in, given that maybe you, would, you could make the argument that weapons class sort of fell out of fashion for the Europeans for a while? And then what are some of the obstacles you're finding when it comes to coordinating um, fires? Is it mostly a technical issue, or where do you start there? Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so I think it, it varies. Uh, all nations, to include the United States, uh, after the, uh, the wall fell in the early 90s, um, uh, took a, uh, a trajectory with regards to combat forces that um, you know, was a result of the peace dividend. So several countries did um, uh, decrease the, the amount of their artillery forces. And so um, I think what we're seeing uh, from watching what's happening to our east is, uh, is seeing that uh, fires formations are very relevant in 2022 and in the future. And uh, every nation that I've engaged uh, has fires formations and uh, they aspire to, uh, to modernize and grow them just as the United States is as well. Um, with regards to the challenges that, um, that we face, you know, we've had uh, exercises, you know, the, one of the great um, uh, testimonies of, of how well our exercise program has been designed over the years is it's, it's readied us for where we are in time and space right now. So for us in Europe, the, the premier uh, exercise that we run as an artillery formation is called Dynamic Front. We've done six or seven iterations of that over the last decade, and they grow uh, ever more um, complex and ambitious uh, year in and year out. The last one we did was in July, and we had uh, 19 nations participating, um, uh, had over 2,500 soldiers uh, participating. Uh, we, for the first time, uh, did a proof of principle where in addition to having a uh, U.S. artillery brigade uh, that's stationed at Grafenwehr, Germany, we put together a multinational um, uh, fires brigade 
comprised of uh, 11 different nations that came together as a headquarters under the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps as the command and control. And they had multiple different nations that uh, formed firing elements and were able to validate the concept that you could put together formations of smaller donations from countries that don't necessarily have a full battalion or brigade to, um, to, to give to a formation, but can still contribute uh, to the alliance by operating together. So it's an exciting time and, and things like that as we uh, go forward, you know, as I engage with different allies and partners, that what, I'm, what I'm finding is, uh, you know, common threads of places where we can um, pull together capabilities, as John mentioned, and creating the exponential growth. So as we cluster potentially nations that are geographically uh, close, or have cultural commonalities, or even weapon systems commonalities. I think that's the way ahead as we look to be able to optimize the artillery that does exist in the Alliance as we modernize uh, and, and make sure that everything is be able to be brought to bear in the fight. So thank you. Hi, Sidney Friedberg from Breaking Defense Generals. Thank you very much, uh, and congratulations. Uh, Speaking particularly to the MDTF, you mentioned the intelligence capacity is key. Obviously, you're not you know, launching your own geostationary satellites and so forth. So how do you plug, what's the combination of the connections to uh, your organic ISR assets, but also other Army assets, US joint assets, and the multinational assets available in the Alliance that you can draw on for that intelligence capability within the MDTF? Thanks, Sydney. Good to see you again. Sir, thanks for the question. Okay, so, and this may seem a little elementary and basic thinking, but it, how I approach that is we, in order to be successful in this multi-domain task force, in doing one of the two tasks that the Chief of Staff of the Army gave us, which is to synchronize long-range precision effects across multiple domains, the, the intelligence aspect of that is pivotal. And what I have found is, and I've seen this honestly in, in all aspects of, you know, in other organizations that I've been involved in, is federating among the intelligence community is absolutely pivotal. And so for us to do that, what I'm doing is investing in understanding all the various intelligence capabilities in all those areas you talked about, whether it be within the Army, whether it be within the Joint Force, whether it be with our multinational partners, is, is building the framework to be able to maneuver through those various intelligence capabilities and to draw from that to go against our very specific problem set. And I think that's important to, to understand for the multi-domain task force. Um, where we become effective is we're, we're an entity that can focus very, at, at very, with precision against problem sets um, that are given to us. And therefore, I can draw from all those various entities that are out there to answer those specific problem sets that I have. And that just goes with good communication. I spend a lot of time on the road talking to various entities, especially in the intelligence communities, to make sure they understand the problem sets that I'm interested in and can then help us out with that federation of intelligence. And Sydney, if I could add, um, additionally, we do spend a lot of time working with our, our joint partners in theater as well. Uh, U.S. Air Forces Europe and, uh, and Africa is a, a full partner in our, um, in our uh, federation that John described. Uh, so we're looking at this from both a, uh, an Army standpoint, but also from a, from a joint and combined standpoint as well. Sydney, could you say that again into the mic, please, for the live stream? Sure. Um, how much of that is a people problem, a human dimension problem, in the words of the New Doctrine, of getting to know who's who in joint and multinational intelligence? How much of that is a technical problem, a networking problem, of getting the data to flow from different intelligence systems, different databases, different standards, and get it into actionable form that you can pass along to the fires community 
in the really tight timelines people are envisioning for multi-domain fights. John, can I take that? Sure, sir. So that, that's the, that's the, the big um, uh, elephant in the, the room, Sydney. You know, how, how we're able to, in the future, be able to leverage the advancement in uh, supercomputing and AI to be able to gather from all sources, whether it be um, national technical means, whether it be uh, an observer on the hill with binoculars and everything in between, uh, from not just the United States, not just the U.S. Army, but our joint and, um, and allied um, uh, partners as well. Uh, how do we take all of that data that's gathered, wash it through um, AI-enabled decision-making tools that allow uh, commanders to be able to visualize the battlefield in real time and make decisions or affect the decisions that have already been made by passing in real time through a cross-domain solution to the best shooter, whether they be uh, an allied uh, HIMARS battery or a, uh, an Air Force squadron or whether they be the organic assets within the multi-domain task force? I think the answer is yes, it's both. There, you know, there is a human side of things because we're going to have to grow to get comfortable with the uh, direction that uh, we're going to go in the future with AI-enabled uh, decision-making tools, but it's also a technical uh, challenge that will continue to grow and evolve and things are just going to get faster as we go. So thank you for that. Sir, it's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Skrzek. I'm the Polish, liaison, Polish Army liaison to HQDA. Um, I wanted to ask, because we are talking about uh, very sophisticated capab capabilities here, and uh, these are very welcome, and some of them are connected directly to forward posturing. And uh, what kind of challenges and what are your expectations, what, what kind of challenges do you see when dealing with partners at the frontiers of NATO within this forward posturing realm, especially when those allies and partners are not part of the Five Eyes and this is the more challenging? Let, let me start and then John, please feel free to jump in. So that, that's an excellent question. And I, I think in an alliance of 30, we have, of course, 30 and soon to be 32, um, national uh, policies on how we share information, what's available, what's not. And so I, I, I try to think of it in, uh, as, as a uh, positive and not a negative. There's an opportunity to, to get better at sharing uh, information. I think the, um, the mission partnered environment uh, initiative that, that uh, is ongoing in Europe to be able to, to bring folks into a network that allows us to share information uh, is, is the key. I think partitioning that to allow each nation to be able to share what they feel comfortable sharing um, is, is going to be the way forward. So bringing everyone into a, a mission partnered environment that can be tailored and, and managed based on national caveats and national beliefs is, is the key to how we get around that. And I think it's an opportunity as opposed to a challenge. Uh, John, if you'd like to and jump in. The one thing I would add to that then, sir, just to continue that conversation is the exercises that we're doing with the various nations, allies and partners are absolutely pivotal to working through what you're talking about. You know, we can sit here and, and think through this all day, but until we actually work together in, in very realistic exercises, um, whether those, you know, be command post exercises and force ourselves to have to be able to work on that communication, that interoperability. It, what I've seen is we're able to to make significant gains in the areas that you're talking about um, as when we work together very closely, when we actually conduct these exercises. And, and I see it improving dramatically. I've seen it with the, the various exercise um, campaigns that we've had, and uh, sir, you might want to mention a few yeah. of those. So um, one of the things that I think is, is, is critical as we look at how to optimize the mission partner environment is to make sure that we're not building a structure for an exercise and then tearing it down after the exercise. What we need to do is ensure that we've got a, uh, a rel NATO environment that is persistent, that exists at all times so that our day in and day out interactions can be conducted uh, via that network. And then, you know, as classifications go up and down based on national policies, then, then we work through those. But I, you know, I think if we look at the, 
uh, technology enabling us to be more inclusive as opposed to being more restrictive. Uh, it, it certainly is, uh, is the trajectory that we want to go. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple more. General, thank you. Um, my name's uh, uh, Mark Evans. I'm a colonel in the British Army in the Futures Directorate. Thanks very much for the talk. We're fully on board with the direction of travel. Um, how much are you intending to drive NATO standards into, into your work? I, I think that's absolutely critical. Uh, the, the interoperability uh, from a, um, much more than the, the human interoperability, which we practice all the time, the technical and procedural uh, are so much easier when they're, uh, when they're uh, driven by STANAGs that we've agreed to. And so as we uh, start breaking new ground into uh, thinking through uh, how we create effects in domains that have not been widely rehearsed and practiced in the past, I think we need to continue to evolve using our time-tested uh, procedures of, of developing the STANAGs to allow us to to understand what the baseline is for interoperability so that we can snap that chalk line and then adjust from there as we need to. Something that we're doing is, is approaching this problem set differently. We're, we're, we're wanting to start with the NATO structure and then build backwards, which you know, I won't say we always have done well in the past, but I think it's going to be absolutely pivotal because depending on the situation as various entities, you know, participate, if you have that structure built into it that can, that can adapt to various NATO countries uh, involving themselves in an operation or, or other aspect, it's uh, pivotal to have that. I think it'll speed things up. It'll speed up how fast we can communicate, work together, and interoperate. And I would add, uh, in addition to our travels uh, to, uh, to visit bilaterally with our uh, allies and partners, we've also spent uh, a bit of time traveling uh, uh, to NATO headquarters as well. Um, we're, we're limited, obviously, by the, uh, the amount of days that we can uh, be out and about, but um, we have been to NATO Corps, we have been to JFC, we have been to NATO headquarters at ACO, and, and we continue to have conversations about how we, um, how we become a combat multiplier for the alliance and not just for the U.S. Um, Army or the U.S. Joint Force in Europe. Sir? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lakey, retiring, um, the guy who drew this up on a whiteboard for General Brown uh, back many years ago. I don't know if you've ever heard people say bad things about me, but my question is a little bit, how do we see this evolving? Because I've been out of it for a few years. Uh, and um, how do you relate? I've got two parts. The other part is how do you think about the difference between a multi-domain task force in Europe? And of course, we envisioned a lot of it in the Pacific. So I think that's another key theater. And uh, those are two things I just wanted to ask you. Thank you. First, and this is my viewpoint, I think we have it about right in terms of the framework in terms of the task organization. So if you built that, um, what I'm seeing is between the first and the second who we communicate very closely with, it is, it's very applicable as a whole to various problem sets. But make no mistake, um, the different theaters, are appro you approach them very differently from a multi-domain operational aspect. Um, and some of it is extremely obvious, you know, they're dealing with large oceans in the Pacific and the tyranny of distance uh, in Europe. The, that is not the worry. Um, you, they're working at trying to break in, uh, you know, understand the A2AD bubble and how they can penetrate that. Whereas in Europe, you're basically, you know, within that. So you approach the problems that very differently. I think the, the key difference in this is you're each going to have different priorities from that combatant commander and the ASCC commander. What I've seen is the difference is those priorities are just different based on the theater, on what you're going to focus on. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it, uh, from the high levels, they gave us full flexibility to approach this multi-domain problem set um, from 
to, to be able to tackle that and figure it out based on the theater. So I've had a lot of flexibility in doing that. I was not caught in having to do it like somebody else, sir. Well, listen, uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. We look forward to uh, continuing the dialogue with you as we walk around throughout the rest of the, uh, the week here. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time, but thank you for your attention. Thank you for your thoughtful questions, and uh, have a great day.